John. She believed she was being discreet, but little did she realize I was privy to every detail through a colleague of hers who was appalled by the situation. While she schemed, I quietly strategized. Fortunately, I had ample time to quell my anger and ready myself for the impending confrontation. The stage was set, and tonight, following dinner, it would all unfold. Janet. So, tonight's the night, Deborah inquired. Yes, I'm finally going through with it. I'll wait until after dinner, bring him a beer, and then break the news, I affirmed. Just remember to stand your ground. He won't take it well, but you have to be firm, Deborah reminded me. I know. Just as we discussed, he doesn't have a choice. This is what's best for me, and if he truly cares, he'll understand, I reassured her. Exactly. Brace yourself for the yelling and resistance. He'll put up a fight, but eventually, he'll come around. Stay composed but assertive. Let him vent, and he'll realize you mean business, Deborah advised. Right. And as far as he knows, it's only temporary. Once he adjusts, he'll see the benefits. Then, everything will fall into place. Are you sure about this? John can be stubborn. I expressed my concern. Janet, John adores you. Yes, he'll be furious, but deep down, he'll do anything to keep you happy. Even if it means accepting this, Deborah assured me. Okay, I'll trust your judgment, I conceded. Believe me, it took me two failed marriages to figure this out, but with my current husband, he's completely compliant. Give it time, and John will fall in line too. You'll have the security of your marriage and the freedom to explore, Deborah revealed confidently. After wrapping up the day, I returned home to prepare John's favorite dinner. When he arrived, his customary I love you and kiss on the cheek greeted me. Despite my attempts to appear composed, nerves still lingered. This marked a significant shift in our marriage. Yet I held on to the belief that it would all be worth it. Dibra had been sharing her experiences with a female-led marriage, FLM, for some time now. Witnessing how content her husband appeared within their dynamic convinced me that John could find happiness in it too. Dinner conversation flowed smoothly as we exchanged stories about our day and discussed current events. It seemed like any other evening meal for us. Following dinner, I insisted John relax with a beer while I took care of cleanup. He hesitated, eager to assist, but I assured him I had it under control. With leftovers stored and dishes in the dishwasher, the moment arrived. Pouring myself a glass of wine, I mentally steeled myself for the impending conversation and entered the living room prepared to confront the situation head-on. John, darling, we need to have a conversation. I began, stealing myself for what was to come. Of course, sweetheart, what's on your mind? He responded, his tone gentle. Okay, John, I know this might be hard to hear, but it's something I feel I must do. Please understand, it's only temporary, I explained, hoping he would grasp the gravity of the situation. Whatever it is, if it's important to you, I'm on board. Your happiness means everything to me, he replied, surprisingly calm. Thank you for being so understanding. So, we've been talking about starting a family, and I'm almost ready for that. But before we do, there are a few things I need to address, I continued cautiously. That's fantastic news, baby. What do you need to take care of? He inquired eagerly. Here it was, the moment of truth. I took a deep breath, bracing myself for his reaction. Well, John, I need to explore some things before we settle down completely. It's just a temporary phase, and then I'll be fully committed to being the best wife and mother I can be, I confessed, hoping he wouldn't explode. That sounds reasonable, my love. But what exactly do you mean by exploring? He asked, surprising me with his composure. I couldn't believe how well he was taking it. This wasn't the explosive reaction I had anticipated. I plan to date other men for a while, but please understand, it's purely physical. You're the one I love. After a few months, I'll come back to you, and we can focus on building our family, I explained, relieved that he wasn't erupting into anger. Well, Janet, it seems you've already made your decision without needing my permission. While I want to make it clear that I'm not in favor of this, I understand you're your own person. I won't stand in your way if this is what you feel you must do, John calmly expressed, surprising me with his composed response. Denver's insights were proving accurate, 
perhaps John was more accepting than I anticipated. So, Janet, how do you envision this working? Will one of us be moving out, or do you expect me to leave? Are you planning to bring your dates here, or will you be going to their places or hotels? John continued, his tone remaining conversational. Well, I assumed we both still live here. After all, we're still married, and as I mentioned earlier, our intimate life won't change. I might visit their places occasionally, but sometimes I'll bring them here too. On those nights, you'd stay in the spare bedroom. I don't see the need for a hotel when we have space here, I explained, trying to navigate the logistics calmly. Okay, I want to reiterate that I'm not on board with this. However, I have to insist that I won't be intimate with you while this is going on. It's a matter of my own health. Since I won't know who these men are or what their backgrounds entail, I won't risk exposing myself to any potential STDs they might carry. Moreover, once you're done with this phase and decide to come back to me, we'll need to wait until you've been tested and cleared of any risks. You go and enjoy yourself, and don't worry about me, John stated firmly, expressing his boundaries. Well, John, I can't say I'm not disappointed. I love you, and our intimacy means a lot to me, but I understand your concerns. I'll have to live with that, I responded, acknowledging his stance while feeling a pang of sadness. All right, honey, so when do you plan on starting these flings? John inquired, shifting back to practicalities. Deborah and I arranged to meet a couple of guys from work at a club tomorrow night. I'm not sure what will happen, but I might bring one of them back here for the night. Since we won't be intimate anyway, maybe you should move into the spare room for the next couple of months, I suggested, trying to figure out the logistics. Okay, Janet, don't worry about it. I'll make sure I'm settled in the spare room by the time you get back tomorrow night, John replied, returning to his newspaper without further ado. I was astounded by how maturely John handled the situation. Despite his reservations and refusal to engage in intimacy, he remained remarkably accepting. Deborah's prediction seemed spot on. In just a couple of months, John would likely be fully on board with my plan. And as for the no-sex rule, I knew it was only temporary. Given a week or two, he'd be back in our bed, none the wiser about my secret key to his compliance. The next day, I reached out to Deborah with excitement. Hey, Deborah, it's Janet. Hey there, so spill the beans. How did it go with John last night? Deborah inquired eagerly. Oh, you wouldn't believe it. John surprised me with his maturity. I was prepared for fireworks, but he remained calm and accepting throughout the whole conversation. I gushed. That's fantastic. I told you he'd come around. Do you think you'll be able to persuade him to watch tonight? Deborah asked optimistically. I doubt it. Actually, I'm not even going to suggest it yet. He made it clear he wouldn't sleep with me while I'm involved with someone else. I explained, recognizing John's boundary. I bet it won't last long. Give him a week or two of using his hand while knowing there's a beautiful woman next to him, and he'll come crawling back. He might even be desperate enough for sloppy seconds right after your lover, Deborah suggested mischievously. That does sound enticing. Since he refused to touch me, I went ahead and had him move into the spare room. He's packing up right now. He promised he'd be completely out of the mistress bedroom by the time I get home tonight. I shared, amused by the situation. I love that you renamed it the mistress bedroom. I might have to do the same, Deborah chuckled. Oh, absolutely. Well, I'd better start getting ready. See you at the club, I said, preparing to end the call. All right, bye for now, Deborah replied, and we hung up, both eager for the evening's adventures. Later that evening, John had made considerable progress in boxing up my belongings from the bedroom. I questioned the necessity of boxing everything when he could have easily carried armfuls of items down the hall. However, he explained that it would be more efficient, allowing him to sort through belongings and discard unnecessary items directly into the boxes. While I understood the logic, I was preoccupied with getting ready and didn't pay much attention. He complimented me on how attractive I looked in my thong, garter belt, stockings, and five-inch heels. There was no comment from him when I slipped into the little red cocktail dress I had bought for our fifth anniversary last year. It had only been worn once before, 
but it still made me feel stunning. All right, John, I'm heading out. I'll probably be back around one in the morning, so there's no need for you to wait up. Besides, I might not be alone. I informed him as I grabbed my clutch, ready to leave. Don't worry, sweetheart. I'll have everything moved out by then, he assured me, closing the last box. As I left the house, a nagging feeling tugged at my mind, though I couldn't quite identify its source. I pushed it aside, choosing to focus on the excitement of the night ahead. I joined Dibra, Kurt, and Luis at the club. Kurt and Luis, both account managers at work, were undeniably handsome, and according to Dibra and a few other colleagues, generously endowed. So, John really moved all the way into the spare bedroom. Debra inquired as our first round of drinks arrived. Yeah, he finished boxing everything up just before I left. He'd assured me he'd be completely moved out by the time I returned, I confirmed. Is that what he said? Louis chimed in with a chuckle. Yeah, that's his exact quote. I'll be moved out by then. I replied, and we all shared a laugh. I was hoping we could make the little cuck move over and do it on the bed right beside him, Kurt joked eliciting more laughter. Maybe once I've worked on him for a week or two, I giggled. But first, why haven't either of you studs asked me to dance yet? We spent the next few hours dancing and drinking. I danced with both guys multiple times, enjoying their company and the feeling of their hands on my waist. During the slower songs, we cuddled close, and their hands often found their way to my backside. Eventually, Deborah and I slipped away to the powder room to plan the end of the night. After a few rounds of rock, paper, scissors, I ended up taking Lewis home while Deborah left with Kurt. The house was shrouded in darkness as I guided Lewis through the front door. John must have retired to bed already. That was fine. We didn't need an audience just yet. Leading Lewis down the hallway and into my room, I noted with satisfaction that John's belongings had been cleared out. Perhaps I should reward him with a little something tomorrow, like a hand job. It was certainly worth considering, but for now, my focus lay elsewhere. We wasted no time shedding our clothes, though Louis insisted I leave on the garter belt and stockings. My thong had vanished hours ago, a playful memento claimed by either Kurt or Louis, not that it mattered. With John's financial support, replacing it was hardly a concern. Tonight promised to be scorching hot. After Louis left to tend to his family, I slipped into my robe and headed for the kitchen to brew some coffee. I couldn't help but feel a twinge of disappointment that John hadn't already taken care of it. It was past 9 o'clock after all. Typically, he'd have been up for an hour by now. I made a mental note to address this with him later. It seemed reasonable to expect him to have coffee and breakfast ready for me after a late night. So much for the hand job I had considered as a thank you for moving to the spare bedroom while I was out. I settled for a bagel for breakfast before heading to the shower to freshen up. The hot water worked wonders, soothing my tired muscles. With no pressing obligations for the day, I opted for a comfy ensemble, an old pair of shorts, and a t-shirt. Since I'd only be spending time around John, I grabbed a functional bra and a pair of regular panties. Just as I finished tying my hair into a ponytail, my phone began to ring. Hey, Debra, I greeted as I noticed her name on the caller ID. Hi there, so spill the beans. How was Lois last night? She inquired eagerly. He was amazing. Everything I hoped for. Although there's a slight hiccup, he turned down my offer, I confessed. Regarding John, how did he react this morning? Debra asked, shifting the conversation. I'm not sure. I'm actually irritated because he seems to be sleeping in. I was counting on him to have breakfast ready with coffee made by now, I grumbled. Make sure you express your disappointment and set your expectations clear. Keep asserting yourself, but also remember to reward him for his efforts. That'll give him motivation to step up, Deborah advised wisely. I'm starting to get annoyed that he's still not up. Hold on a sec while I give him a wake-up call. I said determinedly. I strode down the hall to the spare bedroom and pounded on the door, calling out John's name. No response. Trying again, I received silence once more. Finally, I turned the knob and flung the door open. Oh, damn, I exclaimed in shock. What's going on? Deborah's voice echoed through the phone. 
John's not here. His clothes are gone from the closet, I replied, panic rising. Hold on, I continued as I sprinted through the house, his trucks missing too, along with all his tools. The nagging feeling in the back of my mind began to solidify. Oh no, I gasped. What? What's happening? Deborah pressed anxiously. John moved out. Now it all makes sense. I misunderstood what he meant. He didn't say he was moving his stuff to the spare room. He said he was moving it out of my room. Then he mentioned being moved out before I got back. I thought he meant out of my room, but he meant out of the entire house. I need to call him and find out where he went, I exclaimed in realization. No, 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 no. That's not the way to handle this. Contacting him now shows weakness. You need to stay strong. Let him come to you, Deborah advised firmly. Trust me, he's just throwing a tantrum. In a few days, he'll come crawling back. This is actually a good thing. Now you have the upper hand to punish him and make him beg to come back. It'll speed up the process. I wouldn't be surprised if you let Luis or Kurt knock you up and make Sean raise the kid. Are you sure about this? I asked, still feeling a bit uncertain. Absolutely. Just look at what my husband does for me, Deborah replied confidently. Well, I have to admit, you've been right about things so far, I conceded. Of course I have. Oh, and Kurt wants to meet you in the storage room at work for an hour on Monday, Deborah added casually. Can we really get away with that? I questioned, feeling a hint of nervousness. Of course, half the girls are doing it. I handle all the scheduling. I'll email you the details. Just mark it as a meeting somewhere else. Don't worry, the boss never goes in there, and anyone who needs something from there knows to ask me first, Debra assured me. We chatted a bit more before ending the call. Despite my apprehension about John moving out, I couldn't deny my love for him and my desire to spend my life with him. But Debra had painted such an enticing picture of the FLNM, with its freedom to explore other men while keeping John as a loyal, submissive husband. Perhaps in a few years, I could negotiate with John to stop seeing other men if I felt ready to give them up. He wouldn't need to know that it would be on my terms. And maybe I could use pegging as a condition for allowing him to come back. I'd need to think about that one. But for now, I needed to recover from last night, gearing up for what would undoubtedly be a long, hard day at work tomorrow. Chuckling at the unintended innuendo, I prepared a simple dinner, enjoyed a glass of wine, and headed to bed. Friday morning. I hadn't heard from John all week, which left me feeling increasingly uneasy. Deborah, however, remained optimistic, assuring me that his silence wasn't entirely unexpected. According to her, he would likely reach out soon. Besides, she pointed out, the longer he stayed away, the more leverage I could gain for his eventual return. Throughout the week, I had been meeting with Kurt, Lewis, and a few other attractive men in the storage room, as arranged. Today's agenda even included a scheduled double teaming with Kurt and Lewis in the afternoon. It was mid-morning on Friday, and during our break, Kurt, Lewis, Deborah, and I were gathered around the coffee maker, engaged in light conversation, when we noticed an elegantly dressed woman approaching us. Janet Thompson, Deborah Allen, Lewis White, and Kurt Anderson. She inquired in a sweet southern drawl. Confirming our identities, we each received an envelope from her, and she snapped a quick picture with a small digital camera. Y'all have been served, she announced before turning and heading toward our boss's office. What's this about? I called out to her retreating figure. Honey, I'm just paid to deliver em, not read em, she replied over her shoulder before entering our boss's office without knocking. She emerged less than a minute later. Y'all have a nice day now, she chirped as she exited the building. With a sense of foreboding, we all opened our envelopes simultaneously, revealing petitions for dissolution of marriage inside. Panic set in as I read the reason listed. Adultery. Frozen in shock, I glanced up to see Louis and Kurt's expressions mirror my own. Oh, damn, they whispered simultaneously as their cell phones began to ring. The situation escalated rapidly as Luis and Kurt received calls from their wives, who had been provided with evidence of their infidelities. Moments later, their possessions were being unceremoniously thrown out of the front door, leaving them in need of alternative accommodation.
The impending service of divorce papers loomed over them. What the hell? Erupted from the interior of our boss's office, prompting him to storm out and confront us. With fury evident in his voice, he shouted our names for all to hear. Thompson, Allen, White Anderson, get your asses in here, now. A sinking feeling settled in the pit of my stomach as we obediently filed past him into his office, the door slamming shut behind us. Bad didn't even begin to cover it. Would any of you idiots care to explain this to me? Our boss demanded, brandishing the Manila envelope in front of us. None of us dared to speak up. Fine, I'll enlighten you morons. It seems the company is being sued for failing to uphold the moral code outlined in our employee handbook. Any guesses as to why? Once again, silence met his question. Allow me to clarify. We're being sued because Mrs. Thompson can't keep her legs closed, Mr. Anderson and Mr. White can't seem to control their urges, and Mrs. Allen has transformed our warehouse into a brothel. Now can any of you assure me that these claims are baseless? Can any of you confirm that, at the very least, these incidents didn't occur on company time or property? Anyone? No. Unbelievable. What the hell were you idiots thinking? And the cherry on top? I can't even fire you until this mess is sorted out thanks to that damn court order. Now get out of my office until I figure out what to do with you. With heads lowered, we shuffled out of his office and returned to our own workspaces. It was hard to focus after that bonk shell. At least I still had a job. I decided to review the divorce petition to gauge the extent of the damage. It was worse than I imagined. He had evidence in the form of pictures, videos, audio recordings, and even notarized letters. An hour later, there was a company-wide email sent from the boss. To all employees. Management has become aware of multiple instances where employees have planned, scheduled, and engaged in activities that directly violate the moral code of conduct outlined in the employee handbook. What's more concerning is that these actions took place during working hours and on company premises. Given the possibility that this issue may be more widespread than initially documented, we are compelled to take immediate and drastic action. Unfortunately, identifying the individuals involved has proven challenging. Therefore, the following measures will be implemented. 1. All employees are required to thoroughly review the moral code outlined in the employee manual. Over the weekend, our aid department will develop an online class to ensure understanding and compliance. Each employee must successfully complete this course by next Friday. 2. Security will conduct random checks of all secluded areas throughout the day, multiple times. This will continue until permanent security cameras are installed to monitor these locations. 3. Effective immediately, access to the storeroom will be restricted. The key will be held by the head of security, and any necessary supplies must be obtained with a security escort. 4. It will closely monitor computer usage to prevent personal activities on company assets. Prohibited activities include scheduling non-work-related meetings, using personal email accounts, accessing non-work-related websites, and engaging in non-work-related text messaging. 5. Socializing with coworkers must be confined to the break room during scheduled breaks and lunch times. Security officers will patrol the building to enforce this policy. Per company policy, the names of those responsible for these actions will not be disclosed. We trust that this information will not be necessary. Thank you for your attention to these matters, management. Two minutes later, my inbox was flooded with hate mail from disgruntled colleagues. After work, I joined the other three at the bar across the street. We managed to snag a small table in the corner amidst several other coworkers enjoying Friday happy hour. Their disdainful glares towards us were far from welcoming. Well, at least we still have jobs, for the time being anyway. It was almost considerate of him, don't you think? But why do you suppose John included that provision in the court order? I pondered aloud. Lewis let out a scoff. Oh, come on. It's pretty obvious. He wasn't trying to spare your feelings. He did it to inflict more pain. What do you mean? I inquired, a mixture of curiosity and apprehension in my voice. Alimony. It might not even matter because he's citing adultery, but this is just insurance against that, 
Lewis explained. If you're employed and earning, a judge won't likely order alimony. But if you were to lose your job and struggle to find another, a sympathetic judge might grant financial support until you're back on your feet. So you hold on to your job until the divorce is finalized. Once that's done and a settlement with our company is reached, we could all find ourselves out of work, sans alimony. This wasn't about helping you, it was about covering his own back. I'll just resign on Monday, then, I declared, attempting to take control of the situation. Good grief. You're truly a natural blonde, aren't you? Kurt remarked. What do you mean? I asked, feeling a bit defensive. Resigning is essentially waving a red flag to the judge, Lewis explained grimly. If you quit your job after being served divorce papers, it'll look like you're trying to manipulate the situation to get alimony. Trust me, the judge won't buy any other explanation. You'll be seen as someone trying to game the system. Your best bet is to hang on to that job for dear life and stash away every penny you can. It's going to be even worse for Luis and me, Kurt chimed in. Our wives will likely get awarded alimony and child support, given our kids in the picture. Imagine the mess when we suddenly lose our jobs and can't find anything close to the same income level. Alimony and child support payments are set based on our current incomes at the time of divorce. Damn, I muttered, feeling the weight of the situation sinking in. This whole female-led marriage thing wasn't sounding so great anymore. I realized I needed to have a serious talk with John and sort things out. As much as I wanted to support my friends, losing my husband wasn't an option. What was I even thinking? Forget my friends, if throwing them under the bus could save my marriage, then let the tossing begin. I swiftly pulled out my phone, ready to make the call. We're sorry, but the number you have dialed is not accepting calls from this number. Damn. Deborah, give me your phone. Why? Because John blocked my number. I need to talk to him and get this shitstorm fixed. She handed me her phone as my three companions looked at me dubiously. We're sorry, but the number you have dialed is not accepting calls from this number. Damn, he blocked yours too. Try Kurt or Lewis. Not a real good idea. I'm trying to fix things here. What do you think he will do if he finds out that the first call I make to him is with the phone of one of my lovers? Yes, I know. You already think that I'm stupid. At this point, I can't even refute that. Given what happened at the office today, I can only say that I had a massive wake-up call. I was in full-blown panic mode. How do you track down a husband who's deliberately avoiding you on a Friday evening? Staking out his workplace was futile since it's closed and he doesn't work weekends. With our cell phones blocked and likely our home and work phones too, direct communication was out of the question. Face-to-face -face seemed like the only option. I needed to find him and confront him head-on. Forget about my pride, forget about these other women's marriages. Right now, all I wanted was to reconcile with my husband. As I scrolled through my contacts, I hoped that one of his friends might have a clue. Unfortunately, none of our mutual friends seemed to know anything. Well, that's not entirely accurate. The ones who still talked to me had no idea, but the ones who now despised me had all the information. However, they weren't about to help me out. Instead, they laughed at my requests for assistance, refusing to even pass on a message. It was humiliating. As I hung up the phone after my unsuccessful attempt to reach John, I sank deeper into my seat, nursing my fourth drink. Just then, Lewis piped up with what he probably thought was a stroke of genius. Well, he began, since our lives have already gone to waste anyway, why don't we go to Janet's and spend the whole night as a foursome? I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Did he really think that was a good idea? Maybe to him, but after the reality check I'd just received, I couldn't entertain the thought. Despite feeling like everything was falling apart, I still clung to the tiny sliver of hope that John and I could salvage our relationship. That hope would vanish in an instant if I gave in to Lewis's suggestion. Politely declining, I suggested that Deborah take them home with her. I had a husband to try to win back, and I wasn't about to jeopardize that chance. Over the weekend, I exhausted every avenue to locate John. From scouring motel parking lots for his truck to driving by his friends' homes at various times, I left no stone unturned. 
I even attempted to tail his best friend, hoping he'd lead me to John. But despite my efforts, I came up empty-handed. Monday morning, I stationed myself across the street from his workplace, eagerly awaiting his arrival. However, as the morning progressed, John never showed up. Disheartened, I lingered for another hour, but there was still no sign of him. By then, I was already late for my own job, but I was beyond caring. The impending settlement meant my employment status was precarious anyway. Bracing myself, I entered the office and approached the receptionist, hoping for some information on John's whereabouts. Unfortunately, I learned he was on leave for the next two weeks. Ignoring the boss's glare, I trudged into the office, already two hours late. At this point, I had exhausted all conventional means of reaching John. Phones were either blocked or risky to use, his friends were uncooperative, and I couldn't even get a message to him at his workplace. Showing up unannounced at his doorstep wasn't feasible, and I had no address for postal correspondence. As I settled into my desk, a glimmer of hope emerged, email. John was diligent about checking his emails. With nothing to lose, I decided to give it a shot, praying that he hadn't blocked my emails. It was worth a try. John, I won't attempt to fabricate excuses, as it would only waste our time. I must admit, I seem to have caught a sudden case of foolishness. It's not fair to blame Deborah. I made my own misguided decision. Yet, the allure of her talk about a female-led marriage seemed irresistible at the time. Deep down, I knew better than to think you'd entertain such an idea. It took a metaphorical blow to the head for me to snap out of it. I'm awake now, profoundly embarrassed and genuinely sorry for my actions. I understand if you can't forgive me just yet. John, despite my recent behavior, my love for you remains unwavering. Please don't blame yourself, this was entirely my doing, born out of sheer idiocy and selfishness. John, my love, though I know I don't deserve it, I beg for your forgiveness. I'm pleading for another chance, willing to do whatever it takes to earn your trust back. I see now how foolish I was to pursue a ethylenum, and I am eager to embrace an NLF with you. Yes, John, I'm offering myself wholly to you, ready to fulfill your every command. I understand the gravity of the word anything. Please, John, I'm laying everything on the line for you. Since it was a condition for my return to you, I've already undergone STD testing, and the results should be available in a couple of days. Just let me know where to send them, and I'll make sure you receive them promptly. John, I recognize you as the finest man I've ever known. I trust that you would never intentionally harm me, even though I may have warranted it. I acknowledge all of this. I'm not asking you to forget or to trust me again. All I seek is the opportunity to be yours in whatever capacity you desire. I desire nothing more than to reunite with you, even if it means accepting the end of our marriage. I hope it doesn't come to that, but I understand that decision isn't mine to make. I take full responsibility for my actions, and I'm prepared for any consequences you deem fitting. Regarding Deborah, Kurt, Lewis, and the lawsuit against my company, Deborah manipulated me into participating in this scheme, and Lewis and Kurt exploited the situation. As you're aware, I'll be terminated once the lawsuit concludes. We're all culpable. Feel free to handle them as you see fit. I'm even willing to assist if you desire. From now on, I willingly submit myself to you. Your devoted servant, Janet. Epilogue. Fortunately, John hadn't taken the step of blocking my email yet. Even more astonishing was that he actually read it. Of course, he didn't fully trust my words. After all, I had already violated the most significant vow I had ever made, the one about forsaking all others. Given my breach of that promise, it was understandable for him to doubt my commitment to any other pledges. All I could do was demonstrate my sincerity to him through consistent actions over time. It has been two years since I sent that email. Lewis and Kurt found themselves deeply embroiled in the turmoil of their divorces. Following the settlement of the lawsuit against the company, all four of us were promptly dismissed from our jobs. Lewis and Kurt eventually secured new employment, albeit with significantly lower wages. They were forced to relocate to a cramped two-bedroom apartment in one of the city's most undesirable neighborhoods. Struggling to make ends meet, they found their social lives dwindling to near non-existence.
Their ex-wives took advantage of the situation to alienate their children from them. I've heard that both women have since found themselves in happier relationships. Regarding myself, John agreed to my proposition of becoming his submissive. Yes, John wanted to put my commitment to the test to see if I would uphold my promise. If I wanted to reconcile with him, I had no alternative. It was a challenging six months, but eventually he eased up a bit. Now he only brings other women home once every couple of months. After losing my job, I ceased working altogether. John received a promotion and now earns enough for us to live comfortably without my income. I predominantly stay at home, caring for our two-year-old twins and managing the household. Most of the time, I'm unclothed, although John recently mentioned that I'll need to start wearing clothes at home soon as the kids are getting older and it might become awkward otherwise. However, for the time being, I only dress when leaving the house or when we have guests over. I still answer the door nude for deliveries. As for Deborah, well, she's still married. Sure, she was also terminated from her job, but nobody really anticipated any significant repercussions for her. She had her husband completely under her control. She'll simply find another job, and life will continue as usual for her. Oh well, life isn't always equitable. Yeah, right. It turns out Marcus wasn't the submissive pushover everyone perceived him to be. Once he gathered all the evidence, he became furious. I thought I had a difficult six months, but compared to hers, mine was a walk in the park. Then, when he felt she'd been sufficiently punished, he served her with divorce papers. While he was subjecting Deborah to torment, he was covertly liquidating all their assets and safeguarding them. He granted her the house. After refinancing and claiming all the equity, then vanished, she lost the house and all the money disappeared. Although she managed to secure another job, it paid only half of what she had been earning before. Additionally, she developed a tarnished reputation. She still goes on dates, but the men are only interested in one thing, getting into her pants. She's currently not dating, though, as she still has another month of antibiotics to complete. You may be wondering why I tolerate this situation, or perhaps you find it amusing that I'm facing the consequences I deserve. If you're upset because John didn't abandon me, I thank God every day for his mercy, though I know I deserved otherwise. I endure because I simply can't fathom life without the love of my life by my side. Yes, John inflicts punishment and degradation upon me, but he still loves me. I retain the freedom to leave whenever I choose, and John has assured me of fair treatment in the event of a divorce. However, I declined his offer. He's an exceptional father, partner, and spouse, and I desire nothing more. I became so fixated on the notion of a female-led marriage that I lost sight of what truly matters. Instead of finding fulfillment in an equal partnership, I've embraced a submissive role to my husband. It wasn't the path I envisioned, but I find contentment in it. Thank you for watching this video to the end. If you liked it, please like it and subscribe to the channel. See you soon. The second story. I spent the past couple of hours behind the wheel, making my way to the Marriott in Baltimore. My plan was to surprise my wife, who's attending a conference there, by dropping in and taking her out to dinner. But let's be real, that's wishful thinking. Over the past three months, I've had this nagging suspicion that my wife might be having an affair with one of her coworkers. Every time she goes on a business trip, training, or conference, it feels like she's betraying our trust. Tonight, I'm determined to confront her and put an end to this uncertainty once and for all. Julia and I have been married for 14 years. We have two wonderful children, Diana, who's 12, and Darren, who's 10. Right now, they're staying with my mother. Julia and I tied the knot right after high school. We've been high school sweethearts, dating for the last two years of school, and marriage seemed like the natural progression. Julia was always a radiant presence, with her long brown hair and slender frame, featuring strong, angular facial features. She never seemed to have an extra ounce of fat on her. Until about three months ago, I believed we had a rock-solid marriage. But lately, there have been little things, subtle shifts in behavior that I couldn't quite put my finger on. I've hesitated to confront her about it, fearing I'd come off as paranoid or jealous. But with today's conference nearby, I see an opportunity to unexpectedly drop in 
and perhaps catch her in the act. Dragging my suit bag behind me, I head to the check-in counter, stealing myself for whatever I might discover. Hello, I'm James Murphy. My wife Julia is here for the insurance conference and is staying in room 214. She mentioned I could pick up a spare key here. After a quick check on the computer, the clerk handed over the key. Could I see some identification, please? Sure thing. It's good that you're being cautious, I replied, presenting my driver's license. My nerves were on edge as I made my way to the elevator. What would I do when I confronted her? What should I say? Should I knock or just barge in? Would she have the safety latch on? Would she be alone? Would she even be in the room? Walking down the hallway, I decided to simply insert the key and try the door. I'd have to play it by ear from there. I tried to move as quietly as possible. After unlocking the door, I cautiously pushed it open, only to find Julia sitting at a desk, engrossed in paperwork. She spun around with a gasp. James, you scared me. What are you doing here? Hey, honey. I had some free time and thought I'd surprise you with dinner, I explained. Fantastic. You're staying the night, right? I could really use the company, she exclaimed, planting a kiss on my lips. Well, it seemed my grand plan to catch her in the act was a complete failure. With a smile, she headed off to freshen up in the bathroom. Julia's toiletry case caught my eye on the dresser, and I decided to rummage through it for some aspirin to soothe my headache from the long drive. While I didn't find any pills, I stumbled upon something unexpected in the side pocket, a pack of six condoms. I sat on the bed, staring at them in my hand, my mind racing with questions and doubts. After our son Darren was born, Julia started taking birth control pills. Unfortunately, they made her nauseous, so we decided that I would undergo a vasectomy. Since then, we hadn't used any form of birth control. It was a relief not to worry about condoms or pills, but now, finding those condoms in her toiletry case left me dumbfounded. I wasn't naive. I quickly concluded that my beloved wife was indeed cheating on me. I felt lost, unsure of what to do next. As I searched through her case, I found a couple of safety pins she kept for clothing emergencies. Taking one of the pins, I carefully punctured a hole through the center of each condom. I then replaced them exactly as I had found them. Julia was still in the shower, so I grabbed my cell phone and called a friend back home. Lester, it's James. I need a favor. No problem. What do you need? Wait about an hour, then call me on my cell and tell me there's been a pipe burst at the school and they need me urgently. Actually, just make the call and I'll handle the rest. Got it. I'll ring you around seven. Take care, buddy. With that, I hung up, feeling a mix of anxiety and determination about what lay ahead. I found myself grappling with the decision not to spend the night with my wife. Regret weighed heavily on me for what had already transpired, and I didn't want to compound it further. The drive home would give me time to gather my thoughts. Though I knew action was necessary, I was still unsure of what course to take. As Julia emerged from the shower, I battled the urge to confront her. Inside, I was consumed with fury, wanting to lash out at this woman who was still technically my wife. Violence was not in my nature. I prided myself on keeping a level head and maintaining composure in any situation. It dawned on me that it might be wiser not to reveal my knowledge of her infidelity. By the time we reached the dining room, I was overwhelmed with a sense of despondency. You can order anything you like, dear. It's all on expenses, I offered. I'm not very hungry, to be honest. I'll just have the small fillet, Julia replied. That sounds good to me, too. Shall we have a bottle of Rosa with that? I suggested, motioning for the waiter. Unable to resist, I felt compelled to probe a bit. Julia, are you content with how our marriage is progressing? Absolutely. I have a lovely home, two wonderful children, and a husband who adores me. What more could I ask for? She replied with a smile. I suppose I just sometimes wonder if I'm doing everything I can to make you happy. I feel incredibly fortunate to have such an amazing wife. Sometimes it feels surreal, I confessed, masking my inner turmoil behind a facade of admiration. Oh, you silly goose. You drove all the way down here just to see me? Well, you really have nothing to worry about. I'm happy and content, and you're doing everything right. 
A woman couldn't ask for a better husband than you, Julia reassured me with a warm smile. As the waiter served our dinners, we engaged in light conversation throughout the meal, discussing trivial topics. Just as the plates were being cleared, my cell phone rang. Apologizing, I excused myself and stepped into the lobby to take the call, not wanting to disturb the other diners. After a brief wait, I returned to the table. That was Lester. There's been a water pipe burst at the school. I really need to head back there as soon as possible. I'm sorry I have to cancel our plans for the night, I explained regretfully. A tinge of disappointment flickered across Julia's face, but I couldn't discern if it was genuine or not. It seemed inconsequential to her whether I stayed or left. Either way, she was going to get what she wanted. As we boarded the elevator, we ran into Bill Sanchez exiting. Bill was the business associate Julia often traveled with. Hi Julia, I stopped by the room to see if you wanted to grab some dinner, but there was no answer. I see why now, Bill remarked, extending his hand. Bill Sanchez, and you must be James. Julia talks about you all the time. James came down for the night, but an emergency came up, and he has to head back, Julia explained smoothly. Guess I'll be sleeping alone again tonight. It was excruciatingly difficult to maintain a pleasant facade while shaking hands and forcing a smile. As we ascended in the elevator, the nagging issue continued to gnaw at me, compelling me to broach the subject once more. Julia, I really think it would be best if you quit your job and I'd feel more at ease if you weren't working alongside Bill. We've talked about this before, and it means a lot to me, I ventured, trying to keep my voice steady. James, I've already told you, I have no plans to leave my job. I enjoy what I do, and I'm gaining valuable experience working with Bill. You need to let go of this paranoia you have about Bill and me, Julia retorted firmly. Back in the room, after a brief kiss, I gathered my belongings and made my way out, bound for the journey home. With every mile, my mind churned with thoughts of Bill stopping by Julia's room after his supper. By the time I reached home, I felt like a wreck. The resentment towards my wife for her actions simmered within me. I wished I possessed the ingenuity to concoct elaborate schemes to catch a cheating spouse, but I felt utterly clueless. What could I possibly do? I couldn't even find a way to avoid intimacy with her. Divorce loomed as the desired outcome yet I lacked substantial evidence to justify it. I felt utterly defeated. My wife was betraying me, and I was powerless to stop it. I refused to tolerate it any longer but knew I needed assistance. Two days later, Julia returned home, sporting a radiant smile that only fueled my anger. I couldn't resist checking her bag, and there it was, a solitary condom, still punctured. Saturday marked the annual Globus Insurance Company picnic, a day meant for enjoyment, especially for the kids. However, I couldn't muster any excitement for the event. Instead, I found myself plagued by the nagging suspicion that some of my colleagues were privy to what was happening in my personal life, leaving me feeling like a cuckold. Desperate to avoid becoming the subject of crude jokes, I kept a low profile, albeit feeling somewhat paranoid. Julia seemed to be relishing the social atmosphere, mingling effortlessly, particularly with Bill. While they weren't displaying any overtly affectionate behavior, their closeness was unmistakable. I found myself sidelined, but strangely, I didn't mind. Hi, I'm Brittany Sanchez. You must be James Murphy, a voice interrupted my thoughts. I turned to find myself face to face with Brittany Sanchez, and I was taken aback. She was stunning the epitome of allure straight out of a pinup magazine. With her long auburn hair and piercing blue eyes, coupled with a perfect physique despite her petite stature, Brittany was a sight to behold. I couldn't help but feel bewildered. I adored my wife, Julia, and found her to be wonderful, but Brittany was undeniably captivating. Why would Bill Sanchez, her husband, cheat on someone as breathtaking as her? Oh, sorry, I was lost in thought. Hi. It's nice to meet you, I greeted Brittany, snapping back to reality. Could we go somewhere quieter, away from the kids and the noise? She asked. Absolutely, let's head down by the lake. I doubt anyone will notice we're gone, I suggested. Sounds good to me, Brittany agreed. We found a secluded spot with benches overlooking the serene waters, away from the hustle and bustle of the picnic. 
I'm all ears. What's on your mind? I inquired as we settled in. Brittany hesitated, clearly grappling with how to broach the delicate topic. Sensing her hesitation, I decided to take the lead. Are you referring to the affair between Bill and my wife? I only found out about it this week, I confessed. Relief washed over Brittany's face. I've known for about two months. I'm preparing to file for divorce, but I need some assistance. I hired a detective to gather evidence, but my lawyer suggested it would strengthen my case if Julia would be willing to testify or provide a notarized statement confirming the affair. What kind of proof do you have? I asked. I have photos and recorded phone conversations. I haven't managed to obtain any videos yet, but the evidence I do have is pretty compelling. I also have documented times and dates, Brittany explained. I'll do what I can to help. I'm not sure how yet, but I'll figure something out. And do you think your lawyer could assist me with divorce papers using some of your evidence? I could really use it, as I have no proof at all, I admitted. I'm also suing Globus. I have statements from certain management-level company officials confirming they were aware of the affair and did nothing to intervene. They'll have to make a choice terminate both of them or face a million-dollar lawsuit, Brittany revealed. Wow, that's impressive, I remarked, genuinely impressed by her determination. Bill's playing golf tomorrow morning. Can you come over to the house around mid-morning? He'll be gone until late afternoon. I can show you what evidence I have, and we can figure out our next steps. I live at 206 Hemlock Avenue in Crestment, Brittany proposed. Sure, consider it a plan. Well, not really a plan, but you get what I mean, I replied with a chuckle. Despite the seriousness of the situation, I found myself feeling at ease with Brittany. We strolled back up to the picnic area, unnoticed by anyone. A sense of optimism washed over me. Perhaps there was a chance to untangle this mess after all. I hope so, anyway. True to expectations, the next morning, Julia informed me she had some errands to run and would be out for a couple of hours. After dropping the kids off at my mom's, I headed over to Crestment. Brittany greeted me at the door, and we made our way to the den. The room was tastefully furnished, with a plush leather couch and a large computer monitor on the table. I have beer, soda, and wine. What's your poison? Brittany offered. Regular soda works for me, Pepsi if you have it. So, what's the story, Brittany? I inquired as I took a seat. Well, in a few minutes, we're going to watch my charming husband play a round of golf, live and in full color. I hope you won't be too shocked, but I think you'll recognize his caddy, Brittany revealed. How on earth did you manage this? I asked, astonished. It cost me 1400 bucks to set everything up. I hope it's worth it. And of course, Bill will foot the bill. I reckon it'll last about two hours, so get comfy. I've got popcorn and nachos to keep us entertained. Oh, and I'll be getting a DVD of the whole thing. You're welcome to a copy, Brittany explained with a wry smile. I'm not exactly thrilled about watching this, but at the same time, I wouldn't miss it for anything. Let the show begin. I remarked with a mix of apprehension and curiosity. For about 20 minutes, we engaged in small talk while Brittany shared the evidence she had gathered about the affair. I was stunned by the photos, tapes, and documents she had compiled. The weight of realization settled upon me. I now knew for certain what Julia was up to, and it crushed me. I was taken aback to discover that Brittany had three large koi ponds in her backyard. Intrigued, I expressed my interest in seeing them and asked if I could bring the children over sometime. Brittany seemed delighted at the idea and eagerly agreed to host them. Just then, there was some activity on the monitor. As predicted by Brittany, Bill and Julia entered the room and wasted no time in shedding their clothes. There was no preamble, no small talk, just a swift transition to the bed. The video quality was impressive, though the sound was a bit distorted. Nevertheless, the visuals were all that mattered. Sitting on the couch beside a stranger, watching my wife and her husband engage in intimate acts felt uncomfortable. Brittany, I hate to interrupt the show, but do we really have to watch all of this? I ventured. I sense that you're not keen on this, Brittany observed. Not really. Honestly, I'm feeling a bit uneasy watching this, especially with you sitting right next to me, I confessed. 
The entire encounter is being recorded, which is all we really need for the lawyers. We don't have to watch it. Frankly, I'm not deriving any pleasure from it either. The storyline seems pretty predictable. So, are you heading home? Brittany responded. Well, actually, I was hoping you could show me your koi ponds instead. I think that would be a lot more interesting than two hours of, well, you know, I suggested. Her eyes lit up at the prospect, simply because I had shown an interest in her hobby. As we made our way to the backyard, I couldn't help but feel that I was in for a far more enjoyable afternoon than my wife was having. The three fish ponds were truly remarkable. As someone with a plumbing background before landing my job at the school, I found the pumping and filter systems particularly fascinating. It surprised me to learn that Bill didn't assist Brittany with her hobby at all, leaving her to hire professionals for any maintenance work on the pipes or pumps. I offered to lend a hand whenever Bill was occupied with golf. My intention wasn't to make advances on Brittany, I genuinely wanted to delve deeper into the world of koi ponds, though spending time with her was an added bonus. Hours flew by as we immersed ourselves in the mesmerizing world of the fish ponds. Reluctantly, we returned to the house, only to find the motel room monitor empty. It was clear it was time for me to head home. Brittany assured me she'd give me a heads up whenever Bill had another golf game so I could bring Diana and Darren along. The following weeks proved to be a challenge. Each time Julia took a shower, I found myself checking her bag. Without fail, I discovered a fresh supply of condoms. It baffled me when she found the time to use them all. I kept a safety pin on my keychain, ready to puncture them if need be. I anticipated Julia's sudden urge to visit her sister any day now. On evenings following Bill's golf games, the kids would excitedly recount their visit to the coy lady, but Julia never seemed interested. They'd proudly display their drawings of the fish and share the names they'd given each one. Yet, she failed to connect Bill's wife to the coy lady. It was evident that she was relieved to have me keeping the kids occupied while she carried on with her infidelity. I made two more attempts to persuade her to quit her job and end her association with Bill, but both were met with the same resolute rejection, the second being particularly hostile. Additionally, I found myself making excuses to avoid intimacy with her, and in response, she hurled a few cutting remarks about my masculinity. While it stung, it only strengthened my resolve to continue my course of action. It was a Tuesday night when Julia dropped the bombshell. James, I've been feeling really stressed out lately. I think I need to take a few days off from work and visit my sister for about a week. Would you be able to watch the kids while I take some time to unwind? She asked. Of course, honey. You've been putting in a lot of overtime and late nights. Taking a trip to your sister sounds like a great idea. It's much better than spending a year with a shrink. Go ahead and enjoy yourself. I'll take care of everything, I replied, masking the turmoil brewing within me. I'm glad you understand. All this extra work has been for the good of the family, but I think I might have overdone it, Julia admitted. That night, sleep eluded me as I mulled over the tasks I had to tackle the next day. Yet, I couldn't deny a sense of relief that this moment had finally arrived. Julia's sister, Zara, and her husband, Noor, lived about three hours away. Noor was an alright guy, but he was completely submissive to Zara's wishes. When Zara said jump, Noor jumped. What intrigued me about the town where they resided was the presence of two abortion clinics. I had meticulously noted down the names, addresses, and hours of operation for both. Moreover, I familiarized myself with the terms of agreement required for service at each clinic. They both mandated a two-day cooling-off period, meaning the soonest Julia could have a procedure scheduled was Friday if her first appointment was on Wednesday. I reasoned she would try to expedite the process to allow for a few days' recovery before returning home. This gave me roughly a day and a half to finalize my plans. It seemed manageable. Once Julia embarked on her supposed rest and recuperation trip, I wasted no time in putting my plans into action. It was difficult for me to admit to my parents that I had failed as a husband, but they were understanding and offered their unwavering support. The kids were enjoying their time with them, and my dad's truck would prove handy for moving Julia's belongings out. By Thursday morning, the lawyer had all the necessary paperwork ready for me to pick up. 
Likewise, Brittany had her documents prepared, intending to serve Bill simultaneously with my serving Julia. However, I couldn't shake the feeling that I owed Julia one last chance to make things right, though my hopes were dwindling. Dad and I busied ourselves packing Julia's belongings for the move. Thursday morning, after a three-hour drive, I arrived at the first clinic, only to be met with disappointment. With one strikeout, I had one more clinic to try, the Family Planning Center. Summoning all the confidence I could muster, I approached the receptionist. Hi, I'm James Murphy. My wife, Julia, mentioned I needed to come in and sign a consensual agreement form. I explained to the receptionist. What kind of form? She inquired. I'm not entirely sure of the exact name, but it's a form indicating that I understand and agree to everything that's happening, and I waive any rights to legal action, I clarified. Hang on a moment. That was Julia Murphy, correct? She verified, clicking away at her computer. Yes, that's right. Do you need any identification? I asked. She shook her head, signaling she didn't require any further identification, then continued typing for a few more seconds. Her sister signed on her behalf, but it would be preferable to have your signature. Let me retrieve the file, she informed me. I mentally braced myself, knowing I had only a couple of minutes to get through. When she returned, she placed the form in front of me and instructed me to sign below Zara's signature. Glancing at the document, I noticed the procedure was scheduled for Friday morning at 11 a.m., with arrival an hour earlier. Is there any outstanding payment required? I inquired, reaching for my checkbook and placing it on the counter. No, your wife has already paid the full amount, $800, in cash. There's nothing further due at this time, she informed me. Thank you for your assistance. It's much appreciated. I expressed my gratitude. The receptionist's efficient handling of the matter eased my burden somewhat. However, the welcome I received upon arriving at Zara and Noor's place was overwhelmingly insincere, bordering on comical. Julia led with, James, what a delightful surprise. What brings you here? Well, Mom and Dad kindly offered to look after the kids for a few days, so I decided to take some sick leave and thought I'd surprise you guys. I guess you could say I needed a bit of a break too, I replied casually. The atmosphere in the room was tense, with everyone seemingly lost in their own thoughts. By putting them on the spot, I had forced them to come up with a solution to my unexpected appearance. Zara silently signaled to Noor to join her in the kitchen, while Julia attempted to fill the silence with inconsequential chatter. After a few minutes, Noor re-entered the room with a suggestion. James, I've got a brilliant idea. I can take the day off tomorrow and borrow my buddy Scott's bass boat. We can head out early and spend the day on the lake, giving the ladies some space. How does that sound, buddy? Sounds perfect to me, Noor. A day out on the water sounds like just what I need to clear my mind. Make sure Scott can join us, I replied, playing along. All right, I'll arrange everything, Noor agreed, visibly relieved at the resolution. With the tension diffused, we proceeded to have a quiet supper and spent the rest of the evening engaged in aimless conversation. The following morning, Scott arrived early with the boat, while Noor busied himself in the kitchen preparing lunch and stocking the cooler with beer. As we loaded the truck and boat, Noor questioned why I wasn't getting into the truck. I've decided to sit this one out, Noor. I suggest you make the most of the day, because I don't think you want to face Zara for the next few hours, I explained calmly. Nor attempted to persuade me to change my mind, but after a brief, heated exchange, I stood firm, and eventually, Scott and Noor departed without me. I made my way into the house and poured myself a cup of coffee, feeling a sense of determination coursing through me. Switching off Zora's cell phone, I then dialed my dad on the landline. Dad was always an early riser, and our conversation lasted for a good two hours. Throughout our chat, the call waiting feature chimed in repeatedly, indicating Noor's persistent attempts to reach Zara, which ultimately went unanswered. As I heard Zara and Julia stirring, I bid farewell to my father and prepared myself for the impending confrontation. Clearing the missed calls from the landline, I switched Zora's cell phone back on. With less than two hours until Julia and Zara's appointment at the Family Planning Center, I braced myself to face the wrath of two furious women.
Finishing my coffee, I brewed another pot, this time for my beloved wife and her sister. James, what on earth are you doing here? Julia exclaimed, shock evident in her voice. I just wasn't feeling up for fishing, so I thought I'd stick around with you guys today. I figure we could go out for a nice lunch together. I have to head back tonight, so I didn't fancy spending the day on a boat with Noor and Scott, I explained casually. Julia's expression turned stern. No, that won't work. Zara and I have plans for today. We'd rather go alone. I can hang out with you anytime, but I only get to see Zara a couple of times a year. You're going to be here all week, Julia. I think you can spare me at least half a day, considering I drove all the way down here. You've got the rest of the week to indulge in your sisterly activities, I asserted firmly. Zara grabbed her cell phone and stormed out of the room, dialing on the go. Meanwhile, Julia slumped in her kitchen chair, looking utterly deflated as if she'd been hit by a truck. From the kitchen, we could hear Zara berating Noor over the phone as if he committed a grave offense. I couldn't help but feel a pang of sympathy for the poor guy, but then again, he did marry her. James, I don't want to be rude about this, but Zara and I really don't want you joining us today. We've got our entire day planned out, and frankly, it doesn't involve you, Julia explained, her tone weary. All right, tell me what you've got lined up for today, and I'll decide. If it doesn't appeal to me, I'll find something else to keep myself occupied, but I still don't quite understand. You've got the whole week here, while I only have today. You're not meeting up with a couple of guys, are you? I teased, trying to lighten the mood. No, for heaven's sake, we're not meeting any guys. We just wanted to do some shopping for intimate stuff, bras, underwear, and nightgowns. It's the kind of shopping where we'd rather not have you guys around. Ogling, while we're trying things on, Julia clarified, exasperated. Well, most of those shops are in the mall, and I can easily find ways to keep myself occupied while you're in the dressing rooms. I'll just tag along and stay out of your way. You won't have to entertain me. And when lunchtime rolls around, I'll treat you to somewhere fancy to make up for any inconvenience I've caused, I reassured, hoping to ease any lingering tensions. Zora stood in the doorway, her expression a mix of frustration and irritation. Despite her silent glare, it was clear she wasn't going to persuade me. Julia, sensing the futility of the situation, stood up. I need to go get dressed, she announced, a note of defeat in her voice. As Julia left the room, Zara shot me a scathing look. You're a real piece of work, you know that? She spat out before following Julia upstairs. About twenty minutes later, the light on the landline phone blinked on, signaling someone upstairs was making a call. Time was ticking. They had an hour before their appointment at the center. I pondered my next move. If they attempted to leave without me, I'd simply follow them and ensure they knew it. However, I doubted they would try such a maneuver. Twenty minutes later, they descended the stairs. All right, James, let's go shopping, Julia declared, her tone laced with a hint of defiance. It was easier than I expected. The phone call upstairs was likely to reschedule the appointment at the family planning center. Since I had mentioned leaving that night, they probably decided to wait until I was gone. My aim wasn't to halt Julia's plans, but rather to make them more inconvenient for her. I insisted on driving my car, determined not to let them ditch me somewhere. A few miles from the house, I pulled into a service station. I meticulously filled up the gas tank, checked the oil and water, and cleaned the windshield, taking my time deliberately. They both sat in the car, simmering with frustration. Arriving at the mall, I parked far out, ensuring a lengthy walk. Once inside, I largely left them to their own devices. I kept a discreet eye on them, but had little interest in their activities or purchases. They didn't appear to be enjoying themselves. Most of their time was spent in intense conversation and gesturing. They bought a few items, likely just to prove they had been shopping. Despite my efforts to remain inconspicuous, I still kept them within sight. It was evident that they were engaged in serious discussion. As the appointment time passed, I had successfully delayed the inevitable. I knew Julia would still proceed with the procedure, so I had no intention of further interference. Around noon, we reconvened at the mall's central court as agreed. We headed to the Olive Garden for lunch and returned home around 2 p.m. 
Conversation during lunch and the drive was minimal. Throughout, I couldn't help but smile to myself, knowing that these two women were seething with animosity towards me, and I relished the feeling. Back at the house, I grabbed a beer and relaxed on the sofa. Noor eventually arrived home, only to endure a 30-minute verbal lashing from Zara. He quickly slipped out, disappearing for a couple of hours before returning in time for supper. After the girls finished tidying up, I asked Noor and Zara if Julia and I could have a private conversation in the kitchen. Zara shot me a disdainful look, but they both retreated to the living room. Julia was visibly still upset with me, her demeanor tense as she braced herself for our conversation. Julia, I need to ask you once more. Will you please consider quitting your job and ending your association with Bill Sanchez? I spoke calmly, trying to maintain composure despite the tension in the room. Her jaw clenched tightly, betraying her simmering frustration. I've told you before, James, I'm not quitting my job, and I'm not cutting ties with Bill. That's final. If you can't accept that, then we have nothing more to discuss. I reached for the Manila envelope by my chair, extracting a legal-sized one. Julia, I've asked you multiple times over the past months, and you've refused each time. I had no other recourse. These are divorce papers. All you need to do is sign them and mail them in. There's even a self-addressed stamped envelope included. If you want a lawyer to review them, that's your prerogative. She glared at me, leaning forward. You can't just divorce me because I won't do what you want. You need grounds for a divorce and you don't have any. I suggest you go home and reconsider your actions. I'm your wife and I have no intention of appending my life just because you're unhappy with my choices. Julia, why did you choose to visit your sister this week? I asked, my tone firm. That's a ridiculous question. We already discussed this, she retorted, her voice tinged with annoyance. That was a lie, and you know it. What was the real reason? I pressed. You think you know everything, don't you? Her response was defensive. Julia, why did you and Zara go to the family planning center on Wednesday? I persisted, noticing her discomfort growing. Silence filled the room, broken only by Julia's uneasy shifting in her chair. Her bravado was slipping. I don't know what you're talking about, she finally muttered, avoiding my gaze. Leaning forward, I adopted a serious tone. Why did you hand over $800 in cash to the family planning center? Her eyes darted away, her discomfort palpable. She remained silent, swallowing hard. Why did you have an appointment at the family planning center for 11 a.m. this morning? What was that money for? I demanded, my voice unwavering. Stop badgering me. It's none of your business. Her anger flared up again. Julia, the family planning center performs abortions. You know it, I know it, and everyone in town knows it. Given that I've had a vasectomy, why would you need an abortion? I confronted her directly. Her response was cutting. Maybe your operation wasn't as successful as you thought. Perhaps you should get yourself checked. I retrieved the lab reports from the envelope beside me. Here are three lab reports. Two months ago, one month ago, and last week. They all confirm that I'm sterile. Do you have a report from the family planning center confirming that you're not pregnant? You're truly despicable. But that's still not enough to justify divorce, Julia retorted, her tone laced with resentment. Why won't you just admit that you've been having an affair with Bill Sanchez for the past six months? We both know the truth, yet you refuse to acknowledge it, I challenged. You have no evidence whatsoever that I've been involved with anyone else. I don't want to sit here and listen to your baseless accusations, she fired back defensively. So nothing happened between you and Bill Sanchez, I pressed. Absolutely not. I'm your wife, and I've been faithful to you, she asserted firmly. Then how did you become pregnant? I asked pointedly. She bit her lip hard, unable to respond without incriminating herself. As I placed the stack of photos on the table, Julia erupted in anger. Stop it. Just stop it. All right, fine. I get it. You've been spying on me like some sneaky, perverted creep. If you knew something was going on, why didn't you confront me like a man? Instead, you resort to this cowardly behavior. Your pathetic actions make me sick. As my cell phone rang, I answered, Hi, Dad. Okay, ten minutes works. Thanks for letting me know.
Hanging up, Julia interrupted. What was that about? Dad's bringing your belongings here to Zara's place. He'll be here in about 10 minutes. The locks on our house have been changed. If there's anything we forgot to pack, just let me know, and I'll bring it down to you, I explained, trying to keep my tone neutral. She remained silent, absorbing the information. Here's the title to your car. I've signed it over to you. In this envelope is half of the money from our bank accounts, approximately $1,200. I've arranged for you to have visitation rights with the kids once a week, and if you're willing to provide a notarized statement confirming the affair, I'll allow overnight stays once a month, I continued, handing her the documents. Oh, by the way, there's a DVD I didn't get to show you. It's from the May 10th visit you and Bill made to the Scandia Motel. It's two hours long and captures everything in those photos. I mentioned, gesturing towards the images on the table. I didn't take any of these. Frankly, I didn't care about your activities. I just couldn't tolerate being deceived. Lastly, I'd like you to have this keepsake of our love. I handed her the safety pin, sliding it across the table. What's this? She demanded. That's the pin I used to poke holes in all your condoms for the past two months. Did you know you went through 48 rubbers in the last two weeks alone? You despicable coward. That's the most disgusting thing I've ever heard of. You're a real bastard. No, darling, the most disgusting thing is cheating on your husband. I may be a bastard, but you're a genuine cheating slut. Sorry, I have to run. Dad just pulled up in the driveway. Oh, and in case you missed it, you never said you were sorry, nor did you apologize for what you did. I don't think you deserve to be married to me. Goodbye, Julia. Enjoy your abortion on Monday. She finally started crying as I left the room. Zara rushed in to comfort her, while Nora followed me out onto the front porch. What the hell are you doing, man? Nora grabbed my arm. You two have been married for 14 years. You can't just throw that all away over a misunderstanding. A misunderstanding? Nor, why did my wife come down to visit you and Zara? I pressed. He looked down at his feet, pondering for a moment. Sorry, James. Let me help you unload the truck. We managed to unload the truck in about 10 minutes. Julia was wailing the entire time in the kitchen. I didn't know what she was crying about, and frankly, I didn't care. Bill and Julia were both fired from Globus the following week. Julia refused to sign an affidavit, but the lawyer assured me that our case was strong enough without it. After that night, I didn't hear from her at all. She didn't come to see the children, but they didn't seem bothered, as they were forming a strong bond with Brittany. We spent a lot of time together as a family, being careful not to jeopardize the divorces. The kids and I were learning a lot about Koi and having a great time doing it. Finally, after four months, both divorces were finalized. Julia didn't contest hers, but Bill fought tooth and nail. He lost the house, all the investments, and ended up with a hefty monthly alimony payment. A few days before Christmas, Julia showed up at the house with presents for the kids. I remained polite and didn't do anything to ruin the holiday spirit. She stayed for about two hours and left quietly. We didn't discuss the divorce or the affair. I put the house up for sale, and two months later, we moved in with Brittany. Bill took a job in Omaha, and Julia went with him. Four months later, Bill disappeared without telling her where he was going. Julia moved back in with Zara after Nor left for a job on the Alaskan pipeline. Two months later, Zara received divorce papers in the mail. I'm sure the two sisters are a good company for each other. Brittany and I are comfortable together. She adores the kids, and they feel the same way about her. We're planning on getting married in June and spend every moment we can practicing for the honeymoon. Thank you for watching this video to the end. If you liked it, please like it and subscribe to the channel. See you soon. The third story. Mondays were always a sore spot for me, and this particular Monday shaped up to be one of the worst in recent memory. My wife Janet seemed unusually distant and somber, going through the motions of fixing breakfast for our boys and me with a robotic efficiency. It wasn't that she was being intentionally unpleasant, just weighed down by a heavy sense of despondency that cast a shadow over the morning. I couldn't quite pinpoint the cause of her mood, nor did I feel particularly compelled to pry and ask. 
As my two sons, Dylan, aged 16, and Nathan, 18, headed off to school, I set out for another day at the freight company where I'd been employed for the past 15 years. Loading and unloading container ships was tough, demanding work, but it provided a steady income. It was a job that resonated with me, perhaps because it brought me as close to the sea as I could realistically get. My true passion lay in sailing the world, exploring distant shores and meeting new people. But the responsibilities of home and family took precedence, a fact that I accepted with a mixture of contentment and resignation. Despite the allure of my maritime dreams, I cherished the stability and love that defined my life at home with my wife and two sons, even if it meant enduring another dreaded Monday. However, the real thorn in my side at work was the people I had to deal with, particularly Andrew Beverly, whose sheer obnoxiousness knew no bounds. He was invariably accompanied by his trio of cohorts from our high school days, Matthew Daniels, Alan Evans, and James Gilmore. I'd never cared for them back then, and my sentiments hadn't softened over the years. Hey Michael, missed you at the party Saturday night. Andrew's voice cut through the office, signaling the start of what promised to be another unpleasant encounter. Memories of the company party flooded back, the one I had missed because my sons and I had to assist my father in Chester, clearing out my childhood home after my mother's passing six months prior. Janet had been disappointed, but I encouraged her to attend without us. When we returned late Sunday, her nonchalant response about the party had left me feeling uneasy. I met Andrew's gaze with a steely glare, opting for silence instead of engaging in his provocations. We're sorry you couldn't make it, Michael, but thanks for letting your wife grace us with her presence. She really made the night special, Andrew continued, his words dripping with insincerity, echoed by the laughter of his companions, who seemed to relish their private joke at my expense. Feeling my fists clench involuntarily, I fought to control my rising anger as Andrew persisted, trailing after me with his taunts. She's blossomed quite nicely since high school, hasn't she, Michael? You're a lucky man to come home to that every night. It was evident from the outset that the day was destined to be an arduous one. The tension coiled within me, manifesting in pulsating veins on my forehead and taut tendons in my neck. Controlling my temper had been a lifelong battle, and once again I endeavored to simply walk away. But Andrew, relentless as ever, had one last dake in his arsenal. With a flick of his hand, he sent something hurtling toward me, a pair of red panties. Janet must have left these behind on Saturday, he jeered, his words punctuated by the uproarious laughter of his cohorts. I stood there refusing to meet their gaze as the silk fabric landed at my feet, abandoned and disregarded. My breath caught in my chest, my stomach muscles coiling with tension. Anger simmered beneath the surface, threatening to erupt like a volcano. I knew I could take any one of them in a fight, but facing them all at once presented a formidable challenge. At that moment, however, consequences mattered little to me. I began to advance toward my tormentors when a firm grip seized my shoulder. Paul Riley, the dock foreman, locked eyes with me and wordlessly motioned toward the main office. No words were exchanged as I shot a searing glare at the group, a gaze brimming with a hatred they had never before witnessed. Reluctantly, I followed Paul up the stairs, noting the sudden shift in demeanor among my antagonizers, laughter replaced by apprehension. Inside Denzel Morgan's office, I took a seat across from his secretary, Camilla, as Paul engaged in conversation with his superior. Michael, would you like a cup of coffee? Camilla offered. No thanks. I'm too upset to hold a cup right now, I replied, my frustration palpable. Through the glass partition, I could observe Paul and Denzel engrossed in what appeared to be a serious conversation. Camilla, were you at the party Saturday night? I inquired, seeking some clarity in the midst of confusion. She simply nodded in affirmation. Can you tell me what the hell happened? I have no idea what's going on. Janet didn't say anything, and I don't know what to do. I pleaded, desperate for answers. I shouldn't say anything, Michael. That's something you should discuss with your wife. Camilla deflected, her gaze shifting to the papers strewn across her desk as if searching for an escape. You were there, Camilla. You saw what happened. Just give me a clue, I pressed, sensing her reluctance to divulge any information. Please, Camilla, I need to know. 
Reluctantly, she began to speak, her voice tinged with discomfort. Janet arrived at the party looking stunning. Andrew wasted no time in plying her with drinks. She seemed to be enjoying herself. Every time Andrew got the drinks refilled, Colin would whisper something to his cronies, and they would all share a laugh. Eventually, Janet and Andrew disappeared into the storeroom. Thirty minutes later, Matthew, Alan, and James followed suit. They were gone for an hour before re-emerging, laughing and joking. Janet had a smile on her face, but she looked disheveled, her hair and dress in disarray. She and Andrew left together about ten minutes later. Thanks, Camilla. I appreciate your honesty, even though it's difficult to hear, I said, acknowledging her disclosure. We sat in silence for another ten minutes before Paul emerged, signaling for me to enter Denzel's office. Michael, I'm not pleased with what transpired this morning. Andrew, Alan, Matthew, and James have each been suspended for a week without pay. Additionally, I'm asking you to take a two-week vacation. Paul filled me in on what happened Saturday, and I assume this is news to you. I can't risk anyone ending up in the hospital. I don't hold you responsible for this, but I expect you to resolve things before returning. I'll provide any support you need through this. Now, get out of here, Denzel instructed sternly. I nodded my thanks to Denzel and expressed gratitude to Camilla once more as I left the office. Andrew and his cohorts were conspicuously absent as I made my way to the parking area, leaving the offending panties behind on the dock. Instead of heading home, I set off driving northward, seeking solace in a place where I could lose myself. With the road stretching ahead, I had ample time to reflect on the past and the present. Janet and I had been classmates in high school. She was never one to conform to societal standards of beauty, her appearance often described as unpolished and unkempt. Yet, it was precisely her nonconformity that drew me to her. Standing tall at six foot three and weighing close to 300 pounds, I was hardly a picture of grace or attractiveness. Socially awkward and lacking in athletic prowess, I found solace in Janet's outsider status, a connection forged by our shared experiences of feeling out of place. Andrew Beverly was the antithesis of me. With his charm, athleticism, and good looks, he embodied everything I wasn't. Rumor had it that girls would vie for his attention, hoping he'd be the one to initiate them into womanhood. Despite never having a steady girlfriend, Andrew never lacked for companionship. I loathed him, especially when he boasted about his conquests, seemingly oblivious to the feelings of those involved, except for Janet. Janet had once tried to catch Andrew's eye, hoping to claim him as her first, but instead of a romantic tryst, she was met with rejection and humiliation. Andrew not only declined her advances, but also publicly ridiculed her, declaring that he only dated girls and wouldn't deign to associate with someone like her. While the rest of the school found amusement in his antics, Janet was left shattered. Seeing this as my opportunity to step in, I began to extend a hand of friendship to her. Without a clue on how to properly court a girl, I simply started being there for her. Before long, our friendship blossomed into something deeper, and by the time we graduated, we were a couple. After graduating, I landed a job as a construction laborer. Within a year, the excess weight melted away, replaced by solid muscle and newfound agility. It was a relief to shed the label of being the butt of jokes. Janet and I tied the knot shortly after, and before we knew it, Dylan and Nathan came into our lives in quick succession. Janet took to working out at a local gym, undergoing a remarkable transformation. Along the way, she mastered the art of styling her hair, applying makeup just right, and dressing to impress. She looked stunning, and I couldn't help but feel a swell of pride knowing she was my wife. I loved her when she was a diamond in the rough, and now she had blossomed into a true princess. Landing the job at the loading dock marked a turning point for us, propelling our lives in a positive direction until today. As I drove down the A14, which eventually merged into the A1, my destination loomed closer with each passing mile. Thoughts of my two sons filled my mind. They inherited the robust stature of our lineage and were a testament to it. We made sure they stayed active, determined to steer them away from the sedentary lifestyle we once led. Nathan stood a bit taller and leaner than Dylan, who boasted formidable hands and arms. Both were in peak physical condition, 
equipped to fend for themselves. We instilled in them the values of restraint and empathy, emphasizing the importance of avoiding bullying behavior. Their aspirations aligned with ours. They both harbored dreams of sailing the seas, a passion that seemed to course through our family's veins. I pledged to support them in whatever endeavors they pursued. Janet was the epitome of a devoted mother and an exceptional wife. She managed our household with precision and prudence, never squandering money on frivolities. From my perspective, we shared a blissful married life. As I continued my journey along the M6, the miles ticking away, the shadows lengthened, and I aimed to reach Port Patrick before nightfall. It was a seven-hour drive, but it was the only destination on my mind at that moment. After what felt like an eternity, I finally spotted the sign for the A75 as the sun dipped below the horizon. Arriving at the Duke's Duck, there was an abundance of parking spaces, a perk of the season. Handing my keys to the bartender, I requested a week-long room rental. I had no luggage, no change of clothes, and no razor, but it didn't matter. He handed me the room key, hanging my car keys in the same spot, and I retreated to a secluded corner with a pint in hand. The amber glow of the streetlight filtered through the bottle glass window, casting a somber atmosphere. It was time to drown my sorrows and escape from reality. Mornings found me awakening in my room, a haze clouding my recollection of the previous night. Often a local patron would assist me up the stairs, depositing me unceremoniously onto the bed, though I never managed to get under the sheets. I splashed water on my face and occasionally took a shower, although it did little to alleviate the pungent odor clinging to my clothes. The unchecked growth of a fierce beard was a stark reminder of my deteriorating state. Every few days, my credit card was swiped to settle the accumulating tab. I had wallowed in self-pity for far too long, and the realization of my stagnant existence was beginning to weigh heavily on me. I sat there, my gaze fixed on the dartboard, my mind clouded and unfocused. Two figures in uniform entered the pub, but I didn't bother acknowledging them directly. They exchanged words with the bartender, and his nod in my direction signaled their attention. Gesturing towards the keys hanging behind him, I assumed they were looking for me. In a moment of surprising lucidity, I pieced together their purpose without them uttering a word. They made no attempt to engage me in conversation. Instead, they simply filled me up with coffee for the next couple of hours. Michael, Michael Labert. Can we have a word with you? One of them finally addressed me. Did I do something wrong? I replied, my voice heavy with resignation. We just need to talk. Are you up for it? The other officer asked. Can we step outside? I requested, seeking the clarity of fresh air. The sun shone brightly, but the remnants of recent rainfall left everything damp. The cobbled street leading to the pub's entrance was slick, and I navigated it cautiously. The incline of the street compounded the sensation of imbalance lingering from my earlier indulgence. Stepping onto the seawall, I welcomed the cool breeze filling my lungs, a refreshing contrast to the stale air inside. Though I didn't smoke, the density of the air indoors felt suffocating. Leaning over the granite barrier, I retched, expelling mostly liquid as a result of my scant solid food intake over the past few days. As my head began to clear, so did my vision. My two companions waited patiently as I collected myself, a growing sense of guilt nagging at me for inconveniencing them. The bench where I eventually seated myself was damp, but I hardly noticed. What can I assist you with, gentlemen? I inquired, eager to address their concerns. Firstly, we've been trying to locate you, as you've been missing for ten days. Secondly, we're attempting to track down Andrew Beverly, and we're hoping you could provide us with some assistance. Well, you found me, so that part of the puzzle is solved. I haven't crossed paths with Andrew Beverly since my arrival here. As the barkeep likely informed you, I've remained within the confines of the inn since I checked in. I'm clueless about Andrew's whereabouts, but I reckon I'll be doing some searching once I return home, I explained to the officers. We conversed for another hour or so. They had no charges to lay against me and after confirming my safety, their inquiry seemed solely fixated on Andrew. They traced my location through my credit card charges, a blunder I won't repeat if a similar situation arises in the future. After bidding them farewell, I descended the hill and purchased some fresh clothing and a toothbrush. 
Despite the unkempt appearance of my beard, I resolved to keep it for a while longer. Following a final shower, I settled my bill and commenced my journey homeward. Along the way, I made several stops, mostly to procrastinate my return. There was nothing awaiting me at home that promised comfort or joy, but I did yearn to reunite with my boys. Upon arrival, I found her seated on the couch, bathed in the glow of a single light. Her hands lay still in her lap, her gaze fixed on me with a mixture of apprehension and sorrow. It appeared she had been crying, although the dim lighting made it difficult to discern. The notion of a beer made me queasy, so I opted for a Coke instead. Taking a seat in the recliner opposite her, I awaited her words, uncertain of what to expect. The boys are staying with friends tonight. I thought it would give us a chance to have some privacy and talk, she began tentatively. Why didn't you mention it before I found out? I probed, a mix of frustration and confusion in my tone. I don't know, I suppose I was afraid, she admitted hesitantly. Afraid of what? I pressed. I wasn't sure how you'd react. I did something foolish, and it didn't turn out as I hoped, she confessed, her voice tinged with regret. Foolish? What exactly happened? I demanded, my patience waning. Michael, please promise you won't get angry, she pleaded, her tone pleading for understanding. I can't promise anything until I know the truth, but go ahead, tell me, I relented, my voice stern yet tinged with apprehension. Do you remember what Andrew did to me in high school? She asked, her voice wavering with emotion. Yes, I replied, the memory still vivid in my mind. I've been wanting to get back at him for that ever since it happened. So, on Saturday night at the party, I thought I saw an opportunity and set a trap for him, she confessed, her words heavy with remorse. That doesn't quite match up with the story I've heard, I remarked, my suspicion growing. Listen to me, Michael. Like I said, it backfired on me. I dressed up real good, and Andrew started to hit up on me. I let him think it was working, and he suggested we go back to the storeroom. We kissed a little because I had to do it to set him up. First we kissed, then I let myself be touched. Why did you do that? What were you thinking? I wanted to get even with him. I wanted to make him pay for humiliating me. So I told him to take off his pants. And when he did, I started laughing at his small size. It was a disgusting act, but in this case, it's appropriate. Go on. I gathered myself and made my way to the door to leave. Outside, Matthew, Alan, and James were waiting, as if Andrew had given them permission to have their turn after him. I passed them without a word and headed to the ladies' room, laughing inwardly at their audacity. When I returned to the party, they were all wearing smug smiles, having spread rumors about their supposed exploits with me in the pantry. It was their petty attempt at revenge for my embarrassing Andrew. Feeling upset, I decided to leave, she recounted, her voice tinged with frustration. I heard you left with Andrew, I interjected. That's not true. I left alone and drove straight home, she clarified. You left your panties there for Andrew, I prodded. No, I simply forgot them in my haste to leave, she admitted sheepishly. Why didn't you tell me any of this? I demanded, my voice tinged with hurt. After they twisted the truth, I was scared and unsure of what to say to you, she confessed, her voice barely above a whisper. So you allowed me to find out for myself in front of my colleagues. I felt like a fool, like a cuckold. They teased me about what supposedly happened, and I couldn't defend myself because I didn't know the truth. I had to piece together the story from a secretary, and even her version doesn't align perfectly with yours. I lamented, a bitter taste of betrayal lingering in my mouth. She wasn't there. I was. What I told you is what happened. Damn it, Michael, I'm your wife. You're supposed to stick up for me and support me, Jen exclaimed, her voice breaking as tears streamed down her cheeks. She retreated into the kitchen, her sobs echoing softly through the room. I sat there, sipping my coke, watching as Janet leaned against the formica table, her tears staining its surface. My love for her was unwavering. She was the only woman I had ever truly cared about, but her words felt like a facade, a desperate attempt to salvage our marriage. Camilla had no motive to deceive me. Despite the turmoil brewing within me, I resisted the urge to interrogate Janet about the inconsistencies in her story. 
Pressing her for the truth would only lead to more anguish, and it wouldn't change what had already transpired. I longed to uncover the truth, but I knew I wouldn't find it from her. So I chose to leave things unresolved, allowing Janet some semblance of peace. After another shower, I climbed into bed beside my wife. She nestled her head against my shoulder, whispering declarations of love before we both succumbed to sleep. With a few days off before returning to work, I spent time with the boys, who greeted me with a mix of relief and reservation. I suggested a trip to London, which they eagerly accepted. Janet seemed pleased to witness the bonding between the men in her family. During the drive, the boys confessed to being suspended for fighting, a serious offense in our household. Reluctantly, they admitted to facing ridicule about their mother's escapade at the party, leading them to take matters into their own hands. They spared their mother the details but sought clarification from me regarding the events of that night. I deflected their inquiries for the time being, opting to delay the conversation. We made our way to the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency, where I requested three applications, much to the boys' excitement. It took us about an hour to complete all the forms, ensuring we had all the necessary documents, such as birth records and passports. Following brief interviews for each of us, the agency provided medical forms to be filled out by a physician. We decided to treat ourselves to supper at Wakamama before heading home, agreeing to keep our plans discreet, refraining from informing Janet or their friends. The next day, we completed our physicals, leaving us with nothing to do but wait. Despite everything, I still harbored deep affection for Janet. She was the only woman I had ever truly loved, the only one I had ever been with, or even kissed. It was difficult for me to reconcile her actions with the person I thought I knew. I found her behavior reprehensible and unforgivable. Yet, I remained open to the possibility of giving her another chance, provided she could somehow substantiate her claims. However, the odds seemed stacked against her. As the week drew to a close, Janet's behavior took a surprising turn. She became increasingly attentive, making a conscious effort to avoid any mention of the party or my trip to Port Patrick. It was as if she was striving to return our life to its former state, oblivious to the rift that had formed between us. That night, Janet displayed an unusual curiosity in bed, and we shared an intimate and enjoyable evening together. She nestled beside me as we slept peacefully until morning. The following day during breakfast, I was blindsided by what I can only describe as the epitome of foolishness. Michael, I've been thinking. I'd like to have another baby, Janet announced. In that moment, the events of the previous night suddenly made sense to me. However, to fully grasp the absurdity of her statement, a bit of context is necessary. Janet had been on birth control pills for several years following the birth of our boys. Approximately three years ago, she began experiencing side effects from the pills, which led her to discontinue using them. We hadn't employed any other form of birth control since then. Sometime later, during a visit to the doctor for a rotator cuff issue, I inquired about a vasectomy. Within 20 minutes, I underwent the procedure, rendering me sterile. I hadn't seen fit to disclose this to Janet. For the past three years, we'd engaged in unprotected intimacy without any discussion of why she couldn't conceive. Now, out of the blue, she expressed a desire to miraculously conceive a child. Either she was incredibly naive or she believed me to be exceptionally gullible. I regarded her with a mixture of astonishment and disbelief. I think that would be wonderful, honey, I replied, masking my inner turmoil with a supported fixate. As a man, I'm not well versed in matters of pregnancy, but given that it had been nearly three weeks since the party, there was a distinct possibility that Janet had missed a period and was attempting to cover her tracks. This revelation shed new light on the situation, prompting me to expedite my plans. With the boys back in school, I seized the opportunity to have a heart-to-heart -heart with them before they headed off. Surprisingly, they seemed to grasp the complexities of my situation with their mother better than I did. Knowing I had their unwavering support and understanding offered a glimmer of comfort amidst the uncertainty looming ahead. At this juncture, I remained unsure of what the future held. Throughout the day, I scored the town in search of Colin Beverly. He had to be somewhere. During lunchtime, I swung by the docks to catch up with Camilla. 
While Matthew, Allen, and James had returned to work, she remained clueless about Andrew's whereabouts. Rumors circulated that he feared my retaliation, a notion that baffled me, as I had always considered myself a peaceable individual. I made a conscious effort to avoid the work area, eager to steer clear of any encounters with my tormentors. Later that afternoon, I paid a visit to a local lawyer, initiating the paperwork necessary to dissolve my marriage to Janet. The decision weighed heavily on me. I had no desire to inflict pain upon her, but the prospect of continuing to live with her was untenable. With the boys on the cusp of independence, I saw no reason to remain tethered to a relationship that had soured irreparably. However, one lingering issue gnawed at me the need to confront Andrew and his cohorts for their role in the demise of my marriage. While I acknowledged that Janet bore primary responsibility, I couldn't bring myself to punish her. Instead, her paramours would bear the brunt of their poor choices. James Gilmore, a married man, made it a habit to stop by Mac Murray's for a pint before heading home. As dusk settled, he emerged from the side door and began his walk along the building towards his car parked at the rear. Seizing the opportunity, I caught him off guard, grabbing his left arm and wrenching it behind his back. With force, I propelled him into the wall, the sound of impact echoing as his face collided with the brick surface. Despite his knees buckling under the pressure, I maintained my grip on his arm, raining down blows upon his kidneys with my right fist. Each strike elicited sickening cracks as ribs gave way beneath the assault. I continued the barrage until his arm went limp at the shoulder socket, at which point I released him, allowing him to crumple to the cobblestones just as a group of onlookers approached. Without a backward glance, I calmly made my way to my car and drove off into the night. Two hours later, I found myself seated in the police station, Janet having put our house up as collateral to secure my bail. Amidst the chaos, Maria Gilmore stormed in, demanding my incarceration for eternity. Though the authorities managed to restrain her, her tirade persisted until Janet intervened. I couldn't discern the contents of their conversation, but Maria's glare as she exited spoke volumes. Dylan and Nathan, having retrieved my car, silently chauffeured me home while Janet followed behind. Though the boys appeared to wear expressions of pride, I refrained from encouraging them with words or actions, mindful of the gravity of the situation. James suffered a dislocated shoulder, a broken nose, two black eyes, and numerous internal injuries yet to be fully diagnosed. Fortunately, although four ribs were fractured, none had punctured his lungs. Upon returning home, my wife and I maintained a tense silence regarding the incident. For the first time in two decades, I opted to sleep on the couch, a minor inconvenience considering the gravity of the situation. The following morning, I rose early, grappling with the weight of uncertainty looming over my next course of action. Meanwhile, the Osakamaru was in the process of unloading at Felix Stowe. Captain Joe's Costa, known for his amiable demeanor, expressed his willingness to accommodate me should I obtain the necessary documentation. Promising to provide him with an update later in the week, I resolved to pursue this potential opportunity. As I made my way home, I decided to stop and refill the gas tank. Just as I completed the task, I noticed a figure rushing towards me. Before I could react, Alan Evans swung a 2x4 at my left side with force. The wood grazed my left arm before striking my ribs, causing searing pain to shoot through my body. I grimaced, struggling to catch my breath as the world blurred around me. Bright flashes erupted behind my closed eyelids as I felt my knees give way beneath me. The wooden club clattered against the asphalt as Alan lost his grip upon impact. Instinct took over as I fell, my right hand instinctively grasping onto fabric, presumably Alan's flannel shirt. Despite the agony coursing through my left side, I twisted my body to the left and drove my right fist, clenched around the fabric, into the ground. I landed heavily on top of Alan, my eyes squeezed shut against the pain radiating from my injured side. Unable to move my left arm, I relied solely on instinct as my right hand relentlessly pounded away. In a frenzy, I hammered down with my right hand, the blows landing on anything within reach, anything that wasn't the unforgiving asphalt. My body moved of its own accord, while my left side curled up defensively, my right side launched a relentless assault. Initially, Alan squirmed beneath me, 
attempting to break free, but soon his movements ceased. I continued to rain down blows until bystanders intervened, pulling me away from the motionless figure below. Gasping for air, each breath a dagger of pain, I struggled to comprehend the chaos that had just unfolded. A medic administered a shot, and I drifted into sleep as they transported me to the hospital. Hours later, I awoke to find my left arm in a sling, my body securely taped, and each breath accompanied by a cautious ache. Janet's presence greeted me, her expression far from pleased. Michael, what on earth were you thinking? She began, causing such a commotion over that minor party incident. Sorry, honey. I didn't provoke anything. Why did your acquaintance attack me with a 2 by 4 and don't downplay what happened as a little party problem? Either you provide a clearer account of what transpired that Saturday, or I'll take further steps to uncover the truth. You're not seeking answers, you're resorting to violence, Janet retorted sharply before storming out. With a wry smile, I watched her leave, only for the doctor to enter the room shortly after. Thankfully, my injuries were more bruises than breaks. Alan's swing had been clumsy, my arm was sore, and the rib fracture superficial. The pain and difficulty breathing stemmed from the impact. The following morning, Dylan and Nathan arrived, their grins wide, but I cautioned them to curb their enthusiasm. Alan, however, fared far worse. His injuries would leave him reliant on a straw for sustenance for the next month, and it would be at least a week before the swelling in his face subsided. One stray blow had even fractured his left collarbone, though in truth, all my strikes had been somewhat haphazard, given the chaotic circumstances. There were no legal repercussions for me, as several witnesses testified that Alan had initiated the attack. I had to call in sick to work again and extend my time off. During a conversation with Camilla, she informed me that Matthew had resigned from his position, and his final paycheck was being forwarded to his brother's residence in Aberdeen. Andrew's whereabouts remained unknown. Communication between Janet and me had deteriorated further, and I found myself sleeping on the couch every night. While I quickly recovered from the need for the arm sling, my ribs remained tender. However, I was grateful to regain normal mobility and breathing. With the departure of the Osaka Maru looming in four days, I visited my lawyer to ensure the divorce papers were in order. I instructed him to serve them in conjunction with my departure. Everything would be left to Janet, including the house, which the bonding company would reclaim upon my inevitable bail jump. I felt indifferent about the material possessions. In preparation for my departure, I made arrangements with acquaintances in Scotland and dedicated time to the gym to recover from the assault. Denzel Clark reluctantly bid me farewell, agreeing to keep my departure discreet and to look out for my sons if needed. Meanwhile, Janet's neglect of household duties became apparent. The laundry piled up, and the overall upkeep of the house declined. Meals were hastily assembled, and our conversations lacked their former vitality. It seemed as if she was regaining the weight she had previously lost. In a mere four weeks, our world had descended into chaos. The following day, my sons excitedly handed me my maritime papers, their enthusiasm evident. Despite my insistence that they wait to make any decisions until completing the current school year, it seemed as though they were already set on their course. Returning to the Osaka Maru, I attended to all necessary arrangements for our upcoming voyage. The quartermaster provided me with a checklist of items to procure before our departure the following morning. After securing my gear and settling into my onboard quarters, I disembarked for the final time. Dylan had left his Triumph Bonneville, 750 parked at the dock's end, ready for my journey to Aberdeen. An eight-hour motorcycle trip is hardly enjoyable. The constant shaking of the Triumph made it impossible to read the odometer, despite the smooth running of the engine and favorable weather conditions. Nonetheless, I was relieved when I finally arrived in Aberdeen. My friends had managed to locate Matthew Daniels and arranged for him to be at the Four Crowns. Access to the men's room at this establishment was through an exterior entrance at the back. After briefly signaling my presence to my companions inside, I positioned myself outside the building, awaiting Matthew's exit. As soon as he emerged, I seized his right arm and forcefully pressed his head against the stone wall of the building as we moved down the alleyway. 
His face scraped along the rough surface, and he stumbled in pain as I led him roughly about 50 feet before releasing him. His agonized moans mixed with cries of distress echoed in the dim light cast by the street lamp. In the feeble illumination, his right eye socket appeared to be filled with blood, his cheekbone visible below his swollen eye, and his entire face bearing the marks of abrasion. Don't kill me, Michael, please don't kill me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Matthew pleaded, his voice trembling with fear. I had no intention of taking his life, but I saw no reason to reassure him of that. I'll give you a choice, Matthew. Tell me the truth about everything that happened at the party, and I'll let you live. Lie to me, and you die. Okay, okay. I'm hurting, Michael, he whimpered. Talk, damn it, and I'll get you a doctor. When Janet came into the party without you, Andrew got all excited. He started bragging about how he was going to get her loaded and sleep with her. She did look good, Michael, honest. She was all dressed up and looked like she wanted to have fun. Andrew started loading her up with drinks, and he told us that we could have sloppy seconds. We didn't think he could pull it off. After a bit, he took her back to the storeroom, and we followed him. Are you sure you want to hear this, Michael? Yes, keep going. Ach, but don't hurt me anymore. When he was done, we two went to the room and did the same thing to her. She and Andrew left together, and I think they stopped someplace before he dropped her off, but I don't know for sure. That's it, Michael. I'm sorry. We didn't hurt her honest, and we didn't make her do anything she didn't want to do. I simply stared at him. Do you know where Andrew Beverly is? He shook his head, indicating a negative response. It was clear that he wasn't in a position to deceive me. His narrative aligned much more closely with Camilla's version of events than Janet's. I rapped on the locked pub door, exchanged greetings with a couple of old acquaintances, and then headed back to my motorcycle. A few miles down the road, I passed an ambulance racing toward the pub. It was early morning when I parked the Triumph at the spot where I had retrieved it and boarded the Osaka Maru. Dylan would retrieve the bike later. My first shift was scheduled for that night, so I spent the remainder of the day recuperating from the grueling journey. That damn motorcycle had really taken its toll on me. In hindsight, I should have opted for the car. Several hours later, I woke up refreshed, took a shower, and grabbed some supper. My supervisor briefed me on my duties, and then left me to my own devices. The job was entry-level and fairly straightforward. However, my fellow crewmates seemed less than welcoming. While they would respond to direct inquiries, they offered no assistance or camaraderie. It was evident that they were friendly with each other, but I found myself excluded from their circle. Despite this, I resolved to persevere and hoped that things would eventually improve. Janet was likely served with divorce papers that morning, and I imagined Matthew Daniels had already divulged his version of events to the authorities. Meanwhile, my son seemed to be finding some amusement in the unfolding drama. After my shift, I retired to my bunk. Two days later, I was called to the captain's office unexpectedly. Captain Costa appeared displeased as I stood before him. Mr. Labert, the Royal Navy has requested permission to land a helicopter on the Osaka Maru to transport you back to the mainland. I received a detailed wire this morning justifying their request. I'll summarize some of the points outlined in the extradition request. If there are any inaccuracies, please clarify. I nodded silently, preparing to hear the summary. They wish to talk to you about the disappearance of a fellow named Andrew Beverly. You have charges against you for the beating of a man named Fred Gilmore so badly that he lost one kidney and might lose the other. You forfeited bail on that charge. You have charges against you for the maiming of a fellow named Alan Evans that was listed as self-defense, but is being changed because of the severity. Finally, on the night you boarded this ship, you beat a man named Matthew Timber in Aberdeen so bad that he lost his right eye. I don't know how the hell you could be here and in Aberdeen at the same time, and I don't want to know. It says here that all this mayhem was done with your bare hands to avenge a personal affront. Do you have any comments, Mr. Labert? Sir, I am sorry for any problems I might have caused you. I mean about the charges. Just that if I could have found Andrew Beverly, he would be in the hospital with the other three. I really don't know where that son of a bitch is. 
I'll pack my things and get ready for the helicopter when it arrives. Captain Costa just looked at me and smiled. That won't be necessary. I told them you never got aboard. There is no Michael Labert on the Osaka Maru. Now get back to work. After the divorce was finalized and Janet lost the house due to my departure, I received a wire from my lawyer about the developments back home. Andrew Beverly was hospitalized with severe injuries, courtesy of my sons Dylan and Nathan, who found him with Janet in our bedroom before the bail bond company reclaimed the property. Janet, pregnant and facing old issues, had relocated to Austell to live with her sister. Meanwhile, my lawyer advised against my return due to pending charges, and he had no information on the whereabouts of my sons. While these updates left me with mixed emotions, the next morning at breakfast, the captain delivered unexpected news. I just wanted to let you know that Dylan and Nathan Labert are not aboard the Tanaka Maru headed for Cape Town. We both smiled. It seemed my destiny as a seafarer was finally coming to fruition. Thank you for watching this video to the end. If you liked it, please like it and subscribe to the channel. See you soon.